Welcome church family uh, to this morning's worship time that's online. We're glad that you are here in attendance with us uh, in this avenue of worship. This morning, before I offer a word of prayer to start us off, I'd like to read a scripture. It's from Isaiah, and it is Isaiah 40, verses 28 through 31. Isaiah 40, 28 through 31. And it says this, Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, he will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on the wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. My hope for you is this coming week that you can use these words to have the strength that you need to get through whatever may be and lean upon the Lord in all things. Let us pray. Father, we just, uh, as always, just want to uh, thank you for the day, for the time of worship, for a time of praise. You deserve all that we can give to you. And we just... Uh, always want to thank you for the word that we have from you as we open up the Bible. It teaches and guides and gives us the strength, as these words tell us, in times of struggle or when we're weary. Father, you are full of love and grace. You are faithful in keeping your promises. Our trust is in you, Father, and you will never fail us. You are perfect and just in all things and full of wisdom. I just pray that your presence here would be a blessing to all as we gather for this time of worship. We just thank you also for Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Good morning, church family. Um, I'm going to ask that you grab a songbook, if you would. I'm going to sing the song, Come Share the Lord, this morning before we partake of communion. The song number in the book is number 364, if you happen to have a book handy. I encourage you to sing along with us. We gather here in Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. No one is a stranger here. Everyone belongs. Finding our forgiveness here. is risen from the dead. The one we love the most is now our gracious host. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. We are now a family of which the Feast for which we wait 
Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we prepare our minds this morning uh, to partake of the bread, and the wine and remember the sacrifice um, that our Lord Jesus made for us. I would like to read Colossians chapter 1 beginning in verse 15. Colossians chapter 1 in verse 15. Speaking of Jesus, it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things in heaven or earth or things by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Let's pray for the loaf. Father, thank you this morning for this time to remember the supremacy and the perfection of the sacrifice that you provided for our salvation, our Lord Jesus. We are thankful, Father, that you were willing to make that sacrifice and that he was willing to remain faithful um, to his ministry of the cross in order to uh, sacrifice himself so that we might have the opportunity to spend eternity with you. Uh, Father, as we consume this bread um, that represents his body, let us remember, Father, that uh, he was in this world just as we are and yet had no sin and was willing to become our sin that we might be set free from sin. And then we would offer a prayer for the cup. Father, we are grateful that you have allowed Jesus to shed his blood to purify us. We know, Father, that we are yours and belong to you because you wrote a covenant on our heart and you sealed it with his blood. And so as we take this cup this morning, Father, um, and turn it into ours uh, so that we can be one with him, that we will remember uh, just exactly what it was that he gave up in order for us to be a part of your family. Uh, we have not words to express, Father, how we feel about that. And so we just want to take a few moments uh, to remember that in our thoughts as we take the cup. Separate and apart from the table is our offering for, uh, is our prayer for the offering. Um, that we collect every week in order to continue the Lord's business, not only in this community, uh, but throughout the world. Um, so let us uh, offer God a prayer for the, the uh, contributions that you, you will make. Uh, Father, thank you for blessing us so richly. Um, you have given us all we need, Father, in our salvation, and we recognize that uh, though we have many wants, we really have no needs, um, and that generally we have more surplus um, of resources than we sometimes will even recognize. And so as we uh, determine this morning, Father, what it is that we want to give back to you joyfully um, and with a cheerful heart, uh, help us, Father, to uh, recognize that uh, by doing this, we are participating um, in spreading the gospel uh, throughout the world, um, whether that be in Africa or in the Philippines or in Mexico or here in our community. Uh, we are so grateful, Father, that you have given us the privilege to share in this wonderful work. Uh, the more we give Jesus away, the more we have to give away. 
And I just pray, Father, that uh, we will come to this plate this morning with full hands and empty pockets. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. I would like to invite you to turn with me to the book of Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. In our last two lessons, I know that we have not been in the text of the book of Acts specifically, but these topics are very important to the understanding of the book of Acts. So that's why I call these three lessons, this one being the third, of course, the supplemental lessons to our study of Acts, the history of us. Notice with me Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. The Apostle Paul writes, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In this supplemental lesson to our series, The Book of Acts, I want to talk, I want to do a biography lesson of the Apostle Paul. And one thing we're going to notice in our study together this morning is that the Apostle Paul was truly, truly, excuse me, a champion of strength. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13, this is not the words of a man who was in want of anything. In fact, he has even said that he has learned how, notice with me what it says, that now that I speak in that I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. It should be our desire as Christians to have the same attitude that the Apostle Paul did. And how did he develop this kind of attitude? And as we have studied so far in the book of Acts together, he's gone through a lot just in the first missionary journey. But he unlocks the answer for us in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13 when he says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. The Apostle Paul knows, as we should as well, is that our strength does not lie within ourselves but it lies within the one who we have become like in death as well as resurrection. For we have, those who have been baptized, have put on Christ. And it is through Christ's strength that we can do all things. And when we develop this attitude, then we will become a champion of strength, just like the Apostle Paul. But his being a champion of strength had characteristics. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 21, we're going to begin this set of characteristics by saying strength in opposition. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 21, it says, Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose? so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests. Now, if you remember in our study of Acts chapter 9, when the Apostle Paul came, came back, everybody viewed him not as the newly converted Saul, but the Saul of Tarsus, the leader uh, within a sect of the Pharisees that would lead Christians to their persecution. And so in Acts chapter 9 and verse 21, the Apostle Paul has come back. He is now converted. He is put on Christ in baptism. And notice what some of the people say about him. There was opposition toward the character of Paul. 
in Acts chapter 9 and verse 23, while in Jerusalem, it was true. Saul of Tarsus was no more. This was a newly converted Saul. And his name would later change in the scripture to Paul. But notice how in verse 23 it says, Now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. This was violent opposition from his countrymen. Those who once loved him, those who once thought of him a hero, is now a traitor. And they're wanting to kill him. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 26, we learn of another group of people that were suspect of this newly converted Christian. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. As we can see in this verse, he even had opposition from the Christian. So now, now let's look at this more specifically. The Apostle Paul, as we have studied so far, has opposition to his character. And more specifically, we see violent opposition from the Jews, and we see a disbelieving opposition from the Christians. But is that really a fair statement? Were they truly disbelieving, or were they looking out for their own safety. I want to err on the side of caution. They were erring on the side of safety. So they were in doubtful opposition rather than disbelieving opposition. But did this stop the Apostle Paul? All this opposition that is around him, did this stop what Jesus gave him to do? Let us go to Acts chapter 9 and verse 22. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 22 it says, But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Notice he didn't stop. He didn't say, Woe is me. What have I done? He kept preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Go to, now go to Acts chapter 9 and verse 27. And he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Barnabas brought Paul before the apostles and this is what Paul told them about himself. You see, he continued speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. How about Acts chapter 9 and verse 29? It says, And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. So in this characteristic that defines the strength, Paul's strength from Christ, we see where his strength can be found in the opposition that he suffered. But we also see strength in frustration. In Acts chapter 18, verses 4 through 10, we have this, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded both Jews and Greeks, when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Why was he frustrated? He was frustrated because his fellow 
wants Jews wouldn't listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But do we see Paul saying, well, nobody's going to listen to me. I give up. We don't see that at all. He kept preaching the gospel. And because of that, justice was saved. Crispus was saved. And all his household and those around him. Notice, and many, the inspired physician writes that many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. So even though there were moments of frustration, he still exhibited strength. How about Acts chapter 22, chapters 22 and 23? We see where Paul gave one last defense before the Jews in Jerusalem. In Acts 22, we see where he gives it before the Jewish people. In Acts 23, he gives it before the Sanhedrin. But yet, they wouldn't listen. They wouldn't listen. And we see the Apostle Paul with inspired hand writing about this in the Roman letter. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 1, he said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Now think about it. Put yourself in the shoes of the Apostle Paul. You're preaching the gospel. You're preaching the message that the Lord Jesus Christ gave you to preach. And guess what? Nobody's listening. Nobody cares to listen. Instead, they want to kill you for what you have to say. You have those that don't want to listen, but they want to be in opposition of you. Now, it's safe to say that many of us would take it only so far before just saying, Oh, I'm done with this. I can't take this kind of pressure anymore. But you see, the Apostle Paul's strength did not come from within himself, but it came from within Christ. How could he write in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is God's power to save for the Jew first and also for the Greek. How could he have that kind of attitude, having this kind of opposition in his way? It's because he knew that his message and the words that he used and the message that he preached, it didn't belong to him. But that first of all, he was a servant a servant doing the will of his master. And it was the master's strength that was giving him the encouragement to move forward. We see another word here from the Apostle Paul talking about his frustration with his countrymen. I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren my countrymen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. But as you can see in Acts, <coughs> excuse me, in Acts 22 <coughs> and in Acts 23, they still wouldn't listen. Some of them did, but many of them didn't. How many times have we felt the same way? How many times have we tried to tell a neighbor about Jesus? Or maybe a disbelieving family member? Or a friend? <clears throat> and they let us know for no uncertain terms that they don't care. They don't want to hear it. And it leaves us frustrated, doesn't it? It leaves us frustrated because we know where the disbelieving are bound for. And we don't want to think of anybody going there, especially those whom we love. The Apostle Paul felt the same way. And that's what we can see in these scriptures. But what gave him the strength to, to keep pressing forward and to keep moving on? It was the strength that resided in him. The strength of Christ. 
If anybody understood Matthew 5, verse 44, it was the Apostle Paul. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. When he was talking before the Sanhedrin, the Apostle Paul, in a fit of rage, called the high priest a whitewashed wall. And when he learned that the man whom he called the whitewashed wall was in fact the high priest, he asked for that man's forgiveness. Now the point was, was, was the high priest of the Jews a whitewashed wall? Yes, he was. But Paul was respecting the man's office. And that's why he begged that man's pardon. Luke 6, verse 28. Jesus, once again, bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. And what we have read in, in these, in Romans 9 and in Romans 10, what we have read in these passages are Paul's prayers that his fellow Jews would listen to Jesus. Not some of them, but all of them. Romans 12, 1, 12, 21, excuse me. If anybody knew this, it was the Apostle Paul. He says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So when we look at our strength in opposition, when we look at our strength in frustration, we must understand and we must learn from the Apostle Paul's example that do not be overcome by evil, but to overcome evil with good. We will never win shouting matches. We will never win most debates, spirited debates, even though now they're called biblical discussions. We weren't, we're not going to win those. We're not going to win those because sides have been chosen. It's going to lead to more frustration, but yet if we're put in those situations, what do we want to do? Well, number one, we want to shine the light of Christ. And I'm not going to shine the light of Christ by bashing my opponent. But for us to develop this mindset, and for us to have the same kind of, of benevolent mindset that we see the Apostle Paul having on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17. That kind of mindset. The kind of mindset to where he debated with those in the Hall of Tyrannus in Ephesus. His strength led him to overcome evil with good. He was trying to overcome the evil of idolatry, the evil of, even in the ancient times, humanism with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if the Apostle Paul can do this, you and I, brother and sister, we can do the same thing. But the next characteristic and the last strength that we're going to talk about regarding the Apostle Paul is a strength that leads to heaven. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, he writes, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul would give his life on the altar of martyrdom. He would be beheaded for the cause of Christ. But he did not worry because he knew that this world was not his home. He was only passing through. He didn't begrudge those whom would lop off his head. 
He accepted the fact that he was going to die for the cause of Christ. And so his last will and testament, if, if you would like to call it this, I believe you can was I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Brothers and sisters, let us have the strength of Paul. The strength, not of Paul, but of Christ. The Apostle Paul says, I can do all things through Him who gives me strength. And if the Apostle Paul was sitting here with me right now, he would tell you that his strength was not Paul. His strength was that which Christ gave to him. And that's how he could look at his death in a joyous way. And even though he was going to be sacrificed on the altar of martyrdom, he knew that heaven was waiting for him. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 17 and 18, he leads this prayer. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Excuse me, this is not a prayer. This is his explanation of how the strength of Christ kept him going. Notice the first phrase. But the Lord stood with me. The Lord didn't only stand with him, but the Lord also strengthened him. Why? So that the message might be preached fully. Notice how he says, through me. And that all the Gentiles might hear. But notice the origin of what gave him his strength. The origin that gave him the message. The origin of all things was the Lord. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. The Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for His heavenly kingdom. To Him be glory forever and ever. Amen. A champion of strength, the Apostle Paul. Let me ask you today, do you possess the strength of the Apostle Paul? There's only one way to possess the strength of the Apostle Paul, and that is to become one with the Lord Jesus Christ, to put him on in baptism. Friend, have you done that? If you haven't, I would love the opportunity to study with you so you can see that the, a Christian's true strength does not lie within themselves, but it lies within the one who gave his life on the cross once for all. Brother, sister, is your strength, is the origin of your strength coming from the Lord? Or are you putting too much on yourself? You see, in this life, there are many trials. We did a lesson on tribulations. And I will say, as the Apostle Paul would, there's no way to overcome those things in a way that is positive for you unless your strength is coming from the Lord. So brother and sister, if you have not been relying on the Lord's strength, would you change that now? Would you rely on the strength that the Lord provides? Because, brother, sister, you might be relying too much on yourself. And if you find yourself doing that, pray to the Lord and ask Him for the strength as well as the wisdom to be better. And as always, if I can pray with you or pray for you, I would love to do so. And until we meet again, I bid you all a very pleasant good morning.
Final song this morning will be a song called Tell Me the Story of Jesus. It's number 387 in the songbook. Please sing along with us. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest, peace and good tidings on earth. Tell me the story of Jesus, right on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Fasting alone in the desert, tell of the days that are past, how for our sins he was tempted, yet was triumphant at last. Tell of the years of his labor, tell of the sorrow he bore. He was despised and afflicted, homeless, rejected, and poor. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell of the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him, tell how he liveth again. Love in that story so tender, clearer than ever I see. Stay, let me weep while you whisper, love paid the ransom for me. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Thank you for tuning into uh, uh, this morning worship series period this morning. Um, I have a scripture I want to read. It's in Hebrews chapter 10. It's verses 23 and 24. And I hope that you can uh, be encouraged by it. <clears throat> Since we are not together or come to you in this avenue of being on a video <clears throat> and hopefully one day we'll be together uh, in the dome and this can all be over with the COVID situation but let me read it and then we'll have a closing prayer Hebrews 10 23 and 24 let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. And through prayer and calls and cards, I just hope uh, that you can be spurred on to those love and good deeds as well as uh, we also try to do that in all that we do. Let us close with a prayer this morning. Father, we're just uh, thankful for your love and your grace that you shower upon us each and every day. We're just thankful for the time that we've had 
together uh, to praise your holy name. I just pray that is, it is good for us and it is uh, great for you that you see your, your children uh, do these things. We love you, Father, uh, and we will desire to be with you that one day. I just pray that you would grant peace in this troubled world uh, that we live in. Um, and through that, uh, we know that we can have you as a source of strength, and you are a refuge. We can read that in the scriptures many times in the book of Psalm. I just pray you continue to lead us in paths of righteousness as we go out uh, this coming week and that we do have a strength in knowing that uh, you are with us. We're thankful that we can be together at all things to show you our love. Help us to start this week with a good heart and a good mind, one full of the things that have been said today and taught as we looked into scripture. Carry us through this next week. Keep us strong. Keep us by your side. Just thank you for all the things that you do. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.